Hey, it's Justin Harvey. Thanks for tuning in to the Anesthesia and Pain Management Success Podcast. With APM Success, we take a close look at important topics pertaining to business, practice management, personal finance, and careers for anesthesiologists and pain management physicians. We work hard to take your critical questions straight to the experts. Thanks for listening. Hello and welcome to episode 223 of APM Success. Happy Thanksgiving week. This week I want to talk about why I think doctors get a bad rap when it comes to investing. Doctors are, uh, I would say, have a reputation to be poor investors. That is maybe even a generous representation of physicians' reputation when it comes to investing. What I think really the case is, is that doctors are average investors who make conspicuous amounts of money. And again, this is a lot of doctors don't (laughs) make conspicuous amounts of money, but doctors have a reputation as people who are high income and are willing to invest in what one might call harebrained schemes. Some of them obviously are reasonable and some are much less reasonable. And I want to talk about that today, but the Dunning-Kruger effect with which some of our listeners may be familiar is the uh, belief that because you are an expert in one field, that expertise translates into other unrelated fields. And some physicians fall prey to this because of significant expertise in a medical specialty. They are prone to think that they do, in fact, have an edge or an inside track when it comes to investing. I'm here to tell you that I care about you and you don't. Now, the people for whom that is not true, you're going to know that you can disregard this, but that's probably less than 1% of all listeners of this podcast right now. So I want to address one of the areas in which the Dunning-Kruger effect is manifest as it relates to investments. And so the content of of the conversation today is going to be around investments and strategies and things like that. I'm not going to talk about specific investments and none of what follows should be construed as an advice as advice for a specific investment please make any investment decision in conjunction with your financial advisor and your tax accountant whenever the uh, dunning kruger effect is most painfully manifest and most destructively manifest it often is in relation to ill liquid investments investment liquidity is one of the most important characteristics of an investment liquidity basically means how easily can something be turned into cash So a stock, a bond, a mutual fund, an ETF, these are investments that by and large and with rare exceptions, they can be turned into cash sometimes in a split seconds notice, sometimes within a day's notice, but generally in a very, very short period of time, you can take the investment that you have, the 137 shares of Apple stock, and you can turn it into $18,000 by selling all of those shares. And it's true that The Dunning-Kruger effect can impact liquid investments as well by taking too much concentration in a certain company or making other inappropriate bets with your portfolio. But I find that the real problem with the the way that physicians interact with investments, when when it's very problematic, it is usually with illiquid investments. And I got the idea from this podcast because one of my clients this week passed me what's called a subscription document. It's a, an invitation to be a limited partner in a non-publicly traded company. In this case, it was a med tech company. And they were extending you know, the ability to participate in this exclusive offering for physicians only in this round of raising capital. And they're seeking you know, aligned partners to help grow the brand and be both clinical, clinically involved and, uh, you know, sort of implicit is you're going to be a a representative and even like a salesman a little bit for for this product, for this therapy. And uh, this is problematic in a lot of ways. The primary reason that I pointed out that I thought that this was problematic, well, a couple things. Number one is it's it's not uncommon if you're a physician to have, have some financial salesperson stroke your ego, say, this is just for the doctors because they're special. You, doctor, are special. I'm not giving this offer to just anyone. And so the fact that you're reading this document right now and that we're extending this opportunity to you, you should feel like you're really something. That is a sales pitch. That is, I have yet to see a case where that's reality. 
Um, the fact is these financial salespeople um, or, you know, fundraising groups within an organization, they know that doctors are not sophisticated when it comes to financial analysis and understanding investment opportunities. And frankly, even sophisticated investors are not always equal to the task of evaluating whether or not this, you know, limited partnership in this medical device company is going to pay off in the long run compared to the other places I could put my money in a more transparent liquid, you know, index fund or mutual fund or ETF or some other strategy. So it is to my client's credit that he, I think he, his spidey sense was tingling a little bit. So he sent me this document. I reviewed it and I said, yeah, this is, this is a non-starter for me based on this client in this, in this instance. And this is not uniformly true. So again, talk to your own advisor about your circumstances, but whenever you're locking up money, especially a big five or six figure sum or more in a company where you don't really have decision-making power, you're still a pat, you're on the bus. You're not driving the bus. You've got a seat (laughs) somewhere in the middle or maybe the back. And your opinion is not going to determine the trajectory of the organization. If you're just a passenger, then it often doesn't make sense to plunk down this kind of money in what's going to be an illiquid investment. Illiquid in this context means you can't turn that investment, that $50,000 or $100,000 or $250,000, you can't turn that into cash in any kind of reasonable time frame. Uh, another true story, the, the place I used to work, uh, an RIA, a registered investment advisory firm, we had this model portfolio position in a what's a closed-end mutual fund. Meaning it's a five tick, a five letter ticker mutual fund that a mutual fund is just a basket of securities, basket of stocks and sometimes bonds and other things in there. And it was what's called a gated fund, meaning you can only sell every three months in this case, quarterly, you can only get turn that investment into cash every three months. In between, if you want to sell it, you got to just get in line and wait until the three months have elapsed and then you can get some liquidity. But there's also a gate. This is a technical financial term that means it's at the discretion of the asset manager if they're going to give you, you know, if you try to sell all your shares, they might only let you sell half. They might only let you sell 10%. They might not let you sell any, depending on what's happening at the fund level. So I am six years into uh, running APM Wealth. This security was purchased for a client at my old firm probably eight years ago now. And I can tell you that we just in the last like couple months, we just turned the last bit of that security into cash. It took eight years of selling every quarter, like placing sales, placing sales, and then getting rejected, rejected, or only filled in part. This is an investment that lacked liquidity. It's not uncommon for doctors to be pitched this kind of thing. Even if it is a mutual fund, that doesn't mean, and even if it is, you know, quarterly liquid in this case, There may be other liquidity constraints that don't let you just turn the whole thing into cash. Uh, This was a very long, drawn out, painful experience. And you can probably guess during this time, the investment went down, 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 down. Part of the reason that the client couldn't get all their money out was because the manager was refusing to redeem all of the shares because they were scrambling to try to stop the bleeding with the fund. And this is a case in which liquidity was hugely problematic. So, Whether it's investing in a device company as a limited partner or some gated mutual fund. Another common one in the physician finance community is um, a closed-end real estate fund. So there's different types of real estate funds, also known as a REIT, R-E-I-T, Real Estate Investment Trust. Um, Some of them are publicly traded, like a mutual fund or an ETF. You buy it on the exchange, which is a basket of uh, properties or mortgages, um, and, and it's intraday. Uh, liquid. You can buy it and sell it at will and turn it into cash, all of it immediately. Others, closed end funds, uh, have limited liquidity, meaning you're signing up for a few years. I only have to look back a couple months to find the last time I had one of my clients who was approached, who sent this opportunity to me and, hey, we're thinking about you know buying an apartment complex and doing some renovations and then raising everybody's rent and improving the value of the property on that basis and then returning some capital to investors. It all sounds good on the chalkboard and sometimes it works. But I've seen enough of these to know that uh, a lot of times it doesn't and there's no liquidity when you need it. So again, I, I don't think these, like if you ever participate in one of these, it's a bad thing, but you need to appropriately size illiquid investments 
Because again, if you're approach, this is a the the real estate one in particular is one of these classic like, oh, this is the doctor's only club. Like this is we're looking out for number one here, and and we're we're trying to do good for those who are doing good in the you know through medicine. And there's this air of exclusivity frequently when it's pitched. You got to really watch out for that. Um, often that is used to make up for a lack of real substance. And the fact is, if this was really an attractive offer, if this developer was really so good at what they're doing. A, they'd be doing it with their own money, or B, they'd be doing it with an institution who could just write them a check for $100 million rather than going to 400 doctors and asking them for 250 grand each. So um, it's it's operationally much simpler that way. So you can bet that if somebody's asking you for 10 grand or 25 grand to subscribe as a physician investor to some opportunity like this, don't think you're special. You're not special. You've been identified as a target investor. <laughs> that may easily be parted from their money. And you got to ask yourself, is this really something that I, do I really know something special about this investment opportunity or am I just letting my guard down because, oh, all the all my buddies in the OR are talking about it. Um, there are other types of illiquid investments that I think I, I would draw it an important distinction. Um, single family homes, if you're if you're buying an actual property, I mean, that can be... That can be good if you have a good pro forma and real estate investing has made many, many millionaires. Um, there, it's still illiquid, but at least you're in control. It's not like you wrote a quarter million dollar check on a $50 million apartment complex and the developer doesn't know you from Adam and you're just at totally at their mercy. If you buy a house and you're going to rent it now, frankly, in these this current interest rate environment, this is getting borderline untenable. And uh, short-term rentals too are seeing a big squeeze. You got to be careful uh, if you're, you know, trying to do the Airbnb thing, especially if you're just getting into it and you're not experienced in this area. The costs of running these types of businesses are going up significantly if you're doing financing. And so be aware of that. But real estate where you're in control, that's a little bit of an exception. That's a different animal. Um, if you're buying a practice or a surgery center, this is a, a business potentially where you could be a a managing partner or a decision maker or a, a real contributor where your performance impacts the trajectory of that business. So those opportunities obviously need to be vetted on their own merits, but I don't immediately hate those opportunities the way that I do a closed end real estate fund or some sort of LP opportunity where you're getting into the series D uh, round uh, for some company that you're not going to have any say in the destiny of. Um, another way to look at this is to think, you know, if you have a meaningful income and a healthy savings rate, I like the idea of, uh, he was, a, I was talking to somebody the other day, another physician friend, we're talking about, uh, stress adjusted returns or stress adjusted. And we're actually talking about locums anesthesia <laughs> and how sometimes, uh, the stress adjusted return, depending on the clinical setting is not that high. Even if your hourly rate is really good as a, and I was saying, I, I used to be a wedding DJ. And I can tell you, even if you make a thousand or two dollars for a few hour engagement, <laughs> the stress adjusted return is not worth it because that, uh, you know, little girl who grew into this bride has been dreaming about this day <laughs> since uh, she was four years old. And if God help you, if the file that you play during the father daughter dance is a corrupted file and it gets halfway through and then everyone's looking at you as like, that is not worth it. Stress adjusted hourly income, not worth it. I think about that in terms of this investment question of, yeah, I guess it's hypothetically possible that less liquid investments may in some cases have, may outperform broader indexes or industries, but it's difficult. To, it's, I mean, it's borderline impossible to tell in advance which those are going to be. And the stress adjusted return, the angst, the emotional difficulty that you experience when you're watching the performance of something that you can't control and can't sell. Not all investors are really wired to be able to succeed in that kind of setting. Are you perhaps better off investing in publicly traded securities, baskets of um, you know, stocks and bonds that are in an ETF vehicle that you can buy and sell at will, that are also, by the way, very transparent, very low cost, tax efficient, etc. Yeah, sure, maybe you're not gonna, you know, make 200 percent in a year or two. <laughs> Um, but there's a lot of benefits to that type of investment approach, at least having that as the chassis, the, the primary part of the vehicle of your investments. That's 
driving down the road. Another, I guess, exception would be practice owners who have a lot of their net worth tied up in practices or surgery centers. Um, if you look at your balance sheet, your net worth, it is primarily your practice. And I, a lot of what I do for my practice owning clients is as soon as that is the case, like let's try as much as possible to diversify because it's hard to sell a practice. It takes years and you may or may not get a good deal for it. And depending on a host of variables, you can significantly mitigate the risk associated with the practice sale, that illiquid asset by building out the rest of your balance sheet with liquid investments that can be turned to cash at a moment's notice and that can be accessed for any purpose that you need. I think those are all the things that I wanted to cover today. Hopefully this is helpful. Hopefully there's some folks out there who I can keep you from driving into the ditch. Uh, when you hear your friends talking about this uh, hot new device or device company and that they're getting in on the ground floor, the people that I know that have invested in the most of those types of opportunities, they they basically say, don't do it. It's not worth it. And it's possible. Yeah, it's possible you might buy a winning lottery ticket. But if you think about the stress adjusted return, <laughs> is it better to do that rather than to just have a robust savings rate in a low cost, fully diversified global equity portfolio doing, you know, tax loss harvesting and uh, looking at the other opportunities to keep your taxes down. That is a more reliable way to build wealth in my observation. So if um, if you're getting pitched these types of opportunities <laughs> and you're wondering how it fits into the big picture, feel free to give me a call or shoot me an email, justin at apm-wealth.com. And would love to help you think about illiquid or liquid investments and, and their relevance to you. Hope everybody has a great turkey day with lots of mashed potatoes and gravy. Look forward to connecting with you again next week. If you liked what you heard this week, head on over to apmsuccess.com where you can find more content and free resources to help you build a successful career in anesthesia and pain management. If you wanted to leave a review in iTunes, I'd also really appreciate it. Thanks for using some of your valuable time to join me today on APM Success.